I've got just the girls for you today. Now, you can take any of your other flames, of course, of course. Ever wondered what really went down in those infamous saloons of the 1800s? Are y'all ready to dust off the pages of history and uncover the spicy secrets of Wild West saloon girls? Well, you're in luck for today. We'll explore the hidden tales of Wild West saloon girls, exposing the secrets and scandals that history tried to keep under wraps. This is the Wild West like you've never known before. I'm really glad I didn't have that piece of cake. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> Ready? This yeah. is gonna be good. Yeah. Gonna like okay, it. easy now. Number 20. Ah Toy used the courts to her benefit. Let's take a moment to explore the tale of Ah Toy, the trailblazing Chinese sex worker who not only conquered the Wild West, but also outwitted the court system of 19th century San Francisco. Ah Toy's journey began in China, where she immigrated with her husband. Tragically, her husband passed away during the ocean crossing, leaving Ah Toy to navigate a new world alone. However, fate had more in store for her. Ah Toy found companionship with the ship's captain, who, in a gesture of generosity, showered her with gold, providing her with a significant nest egg upon reaching San Francisco. Arriving as an Asian woman in the Wild West was nothing short of being a curiosity. Ah Toy, however, turned this curiosity into a business opportunity. She charged clients an ounce of gold for just a peep at her goods. This unique approach not only drew attention, but also built her a substantial fortune over time. As Ah Toy's wealth grew, so did her ambitions. She ventured into entrepreneurship, establishing numerous brothels and even bringing women over from China to work in her establishments. However, success came at a cost. With her lucrative business, Ah Toy became a target for extortion attempts. Yet, she was no stranger to adversity. The brilliance of Ah Toy shines through as she repeatedly utilized the San Francisco court system to safeguard not only herself, but also the women under her care. Her legal acumen became a shield against those who sought to exploit her success. However, the tides turned against her in 1854, when a law prohibited Chinese Americans from seeking justice in the court system. That left Ah Toy vulnerable to harassment from both white Americans and rival Chinese business people. Number 19. Fanny Porter entertained Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid at her brothel. Fanny's establishment was no ordinary brothel. It boasted fine glass fixtures, silk sheets, and plush carpeting setting a standard of luxury that attracted both common patrons and extraordinary guests. Among those guests were none other than the infamous Butch Cassidy and his wild bunch. Fanny's hospitality reached new heights as she welcomed the notorious bandits with chilled champagne and a level of refinement that was unparalleled. Despite her classy demeanor, Fanny was far from a pushover. In fact, she earned a reputation for her fierce independence and resilience. Legend has it that she wasn't afraid to take matters into her own hands, literally chasing law enforcers off her property with a broom, defending her livelihood and the secrecy of her clientele. Fanny's boarding house became more than just a brothel. It served as a multifaceted hub for both Butch Cassidy and his crew. It was a rest stop, a hideout, a rendezvous point, and even a headquarters for their infamous operations. The Sundance Kid, a key member of the Wild Bunch, supposedly crossed paths with his future girlfriend and partner in crime, Etta Place, while she was working under Fanny's roof. The last hurrah at Fanny's place became the stuff of legends. When the Wild Bunch decided to part ways, Fanny, true to her reputation, treated them like genuine VIPs. She orchestrated an elaborate going-away party ensuring that the farewell to these notorious outlaws was as memorable as their stay. Number 18. Molly Johnson was a tabloid superstar. Molly owned a prominent brothel strategically located on one of the corner streets in Deadwood. Her life became a spectacle akin to the fascination we have with modern reality show stars. Molly's every move and eccentricity became the talk of the town regularly making headlines in the Deadwood newspapers. One of Molly's favorite pastimes added to her allure. 
picture this. Molly, in all her audacious glory, renting a carriage and parading it up and down the camp, deliberately snubbing any lesser women she encountered. Her extravagant escapades were the talk of the town, elevating her status to that of a local celebrity. But Molly's story didn't stop at just headline-worthy antics. She made waves when she decided to marry Lou Spencer, a black entertainer, challenging the societal norms of the time. This union further fueled the intrigue surrounding Molly, solidifying her status as a woman unafraid to defy conventions. Known as the Queen of the Blondes, Molly took on a mentorship role for three golden-haired employees, Ida Clark, Ida Chaplin, and Jenny Dachanel. Under Molly's guidance, these women thrived in their profession, adding another layer to Molly's complex and captivating persona. One particular event, immortalized in the papers, showcased Molly's adventurous spirit. After a spirited day at a baseball game, Molly, fueled by the excitement, orchestrated a buggy race involving her and some of her girls. While none of the women were harmed, the buggies reportedly met a dramatic end, reduced to splinters in the exhilarating race. Number 17. Pearl DeVere charged her clients $250 a night. Pearl DeVere's establishment wasn't just a typical brothel, it was a gaming parlor that catered to the affluent gentlemen of Cripple Creek. In stark contrast to the norm, DeVere's girls enjoyed a level of prosperity uncommon in their profession. Regular medical exams, fine clothing, and generous paychecks were part of the perks of working under DeVere's roof. Much like Molly Johnson, DeVere was a woman who embraced the spotlight. She wasn't content with staying behind closed doors. Instead, she paraded around town in her carriage, each time adorned in a new, luxurious outfit. Her daily rounds became a spectacle, capturing the attention and admiration of the men she encountered. But DeVere's ambitions didn't stop there. She envisioned and brought to life the old homestead, an extravagant parlor that redefined decadence in the Wild West. Complete with fine furnishings, a crystal electric chandelier, and a telephone, luxuries considered rare during that period, the old homestead was a testament to DeVere's determination to cater exclusively to the elite. What set the old homestead apart was not just its lavish decor, but also its exclusivity. DeVere charged a staggering $250 a night for the pleasure of experiencing the epitome of Wild West luxury. In today's terms, that would be around $6,500, an extravagant price tag that only the wealthiest clientele could afford. Number 16. Julia Boulette was the original sex worker with a heart of gold. Arriving in Virginia City in 1859, Julia Boulette quickly became the sought-after companion of many miners in town. Choosing to embrace a self-employed path as a sex worker, Julia was more than just a figure of desire. She was renowned for her wit, beauty, and most notably, her heart of gold. Julia's philanthropic contributions to the townspeople were so significant that she was bestowed the honorary title of firefighter, an unusual recognition for a woman of her profession. Her charitable endeavors endeared her to the community, portraying a side of her that transcended the societal perceptions of sex workers in the Old West. Tragically, Julia's story takes a dark turn in 1867. Found brutally slain in her bed, the victim of a heinous crime committed by a French drifter, her untimely demise shocked the community. Number 15. Dora Dufran became a madam at 15. Dora Dufran's journey into the world of the Old West's underbelly began as a dance hall girl. However, her ambition knew no bounds, and by the age of 15, she had already ascended to the title of madam. Establishing herself as a formidable figure, Dufran went on to own several brothels in Deadwood, with the most renowned being Didlin Dora's. The allure of Dora's establishment lay in its promise of the three Ds, dining, drinking, and dancing. A place that boldly declared itself as somewhere you could even bring your mother. Dora Dufran's approach to the profession was both audacious and revolutionary, challenging societal norms of the time. Beyond the walls of Didlandora's, Dufran forged connections that would transcend the boundaries of business. A notable friendship bloomed between her and the legendary Calamity Jane. Their camaraderie endured the passage of time, with the two women remaining friends well into their 40s. 
Their paths reconverged later in life when Calamity Jane, grappling with the effects of alcoholism, sought refuge in Dora's establishment. In an unexpected turn of roles, Jane found employment as a cook and laundry woman under Dufran's care. However, the reunion was short-lived as Calamity Jane passed away not long after, marking the end of an era. Number 14. Sex work could take place in brothels or on the street. While many may envision saloon girls operating discreetly under the watchful eyes of local authorities, the truth paints a different picture. In the Old West, sex work wasn't just a clandestine affair, it was a legitimate form of income. The vast landscapes of unincorporated territories lacked proper governance, creating a space where sex work thrived. Historians suggest that approximately 25% of the Old West's population participated in sex work, with venues ranging from brothels to parlor houses. These establishments boldly advertised their services with hanging red lanterns, enticing those in search of pleasure. The experience extended beyond mere transactions, with game rooms and dancing adding to the allure for patrons anticipating services. Interestingly, the dynamics of sex work varied between venues. Women in brothels enjoyed a degree of protection thanks to vigilant bouncers. On the flip side, those working on the streets had to navigate a more perilous path, fending for themselves in the unpredictable terrain of the Old West. Some women, even after aging out of traditional desirability, found refuge in small houses, continuing to work under the guidance of the madams who had employed them in the past. Number 13. Secret Pregnancies In the world of saloon girls and brothels, one of the gravest challenges a woman could encounter was an unintended pregnancy. Such an occurrence not only jeopardized her livelihood, but also posed significant obstacles to the continuation of her business. An archaeological excavation of an historic brothel, conducted by Boston University, exposed a poignant aspect of these challenges. Syringes used to administer concoctions of mercury, arsenic, and vinegar. These harsh measures were employed to induce abortions or treat diseases, reflecting the desperate lengths women went to in order to navigate the complexities of their circumstances. Adding a layer of complexity, some women found unconventional solutions within the confines of relationships. Mrs. Lake, the owner of a brothel, married a doctor who not only treated sexually transmitted diseases, but also provided medicines for inducing abortions. However, the overarching hurdle was the formidable Comstock Act of 1873. This legislation not only prohibited the distribution of birth control items and information, but also outlawed terminations. Faced with such restrictions, working girls had to resort to crafting their own homemade remedies to prevent pregnancies, perpetuating a clandestine cycle of struggle. The true toll of infants born to working girls in the Old West remains an enigma. Terminations went largely unreported due to the suppressive reach of the Comstock Act. Anne Butler notes that stillborns and fetuses often met a discreet end, quietly disposed of or buried without any formal record. An incident in February of 1877 in Laramie, Wyoming, where Mary Keene and others were charged for failing to provide a proper burial for a fetus, offers a glimpse into the legal ramifications these women faced. Yet, even in the face of such adversity, some managed to navigate the complexities of motherhood, as illustrated by Laura Evans of Colorado, whose daughter Lucille found a life outside the realms of prostitution. In interviews with her great-grandsons, Lucille's reticence about her mother speaks volumes, describing her simply as a landlady. Number 12. A Deadly Love Triangle Revealed A Perilous Journey to the Top of the Wild West Sex Trade Belle Brazing's tale begins in 1860 in Lexington, Kentucky, where she was born to Sarah Ann Cox, a mother struggling against the odds. Sarah's marriage to George Brazing, an abusive alcoholic who abandoned the family, marked the onset of Belle's challenging upbringing. To make ends meet, Sarah juggled part-time work as a dressmaker and a prostitute. As a teenager, Belle found herself entangled in a complicated love triangle, resulting in a deceased man, another on the run, Belle pregnant, and a dissatisfied resolution for all involved. 
Following the birth of her child, Belle continued to live with her mother, despite having married the child's father. Tragically, Sarah passed away a few months later, and their home fell into the hands of the landlord. Faced with dire circumstances, Belle made a pivotal decision to enter the sex industry, quickly ascending to the top of the local market. She even worked in a brothel located in one of Mary Todd Lincoln's former residences, solidifying her status as one of the most famous madams in the Wild West. As Belle ventured out independently, she built a loyal clientele who not only provided business, but also invested in her various brothels. Over the years, she owned several establishments, earning a reputation for having the most orderly of the disorderly houses. Known for her generosity, Belle allowed her employees to keep most of their earnings, while deriving her profits from the liquor she sold, including the finest champagne. Operating in Kentucky until the advent of Prohibition, Belle faced a decline in her fortunes. Her last days were marked by addiction to morphine and the affliction of uterine cancer. Despite her challenges, Belle was remembered as the quintessential lady of the night with a heart of gold, contributing to local charities. So impactful was her legacy that many believe she inspired the character of Belle Watling in Gone with the Wind, although Margaret Mitchell denied the connection. Number 11. Social disease was rampant in the West. Venereal disease was widespread, and treatment of STDs was downright dangerous. As Christopher Knowlton explains in his book, Cattle Kingdom, prostitutes, quote, faced the constant threat of disease, and not only sexually transmitted diseases such as syphilis, popularly known as the calamity in light of the poor prospects for a cure, or gonorrhea, which was equally prevalent. STD treatment was limited, as penicillin wasn't invented yet. Writer Keith Souter tells of using calomel, a powder of mercurious chloride which could cause patients to, quote, salivate, perspire, feel dry, want to vomit, and purge their bowels. But these were symptoms of mercury poisoning. Likewise, gonorrhea was also treated with mercury, but also arsenic and other deadly elements, according to J.R. Thorpe at Bustle. Men who contracted STDs could pass it on to their wives or working girls. In 1907, 19-year-old Anna Groves contracted venereal disease from one of her customers. When the man refused to do anything to help her, Anna fired a shot at him through the window of a Wyoming saloon. The bullet missed its mark, but Anna was arrested anyway. In reporting the incident, Laramie's semi-weekly Boomerang noted that Anna was in poor health, though she, quote, pleaded guilty and expressed regrets that she was such a poor shot. Anna was sentenced to two years in the state penitentiary, but pardoned after five months, when it became painfully apparent that she was fatally ill. Number 10. Rancid Odors A picture may say a thousand words, but it cannot convey the acrid odors of the Old West. Back then, personal hygiene habits were definitely not what they are today. For one thing, bathing, brushing your teeth, washing your hair, and other healthy habits took place far less often. As writer Meg Mims points out on her blog, Cowboy Kisses, shampoo wasn't even invented until the late 1800s. Women were relegated to using plain soap to wash their hair, and that only occurred once a month or so. Most good-time girls kept a basin in their rooms, since cleanliness was important to both them and their customers. Deodorant and toothpaste were rare, too, according to Elena Sandage. Toothpaste wasn't available in a tube until 1892, and deodorant wasn't invented until 1888. Most folks just had to make do with sticky pits and privates. There was makeup, which was basically taboo among proper women, but used by actresses, saloon girls, and prostitutes. Author Sylvia McDaniel verifies that these women used small pots containing carminic acid and aluminum or calcium salts to color their cheeks and lips. They also used hair dye. Outside of their realm, however, shady ladies wore only enough cosmetics, like face powder, to make their skin appear as beautiful and natural as possible. But not until after 1900, according to the Old Farmer's Almanac, did manufactured eyebrow pencils, eyeshadow, face powder, and lipstick become all the rage. Number 9. Scandalous Outfits Saloon girls wore brightly colored ruffled skirts that were scandalously short for the time, mid-shin or knee-length. 
Under the bell-shaped skirts could be seen colorfully hued petticoats that barely reached their kid boots that were often adorned with tassels. More often than not, their arms and shoulders were bare, their bodices cut low over their bosoms, and their dresses decorated with sequins and fringe. Silk, lace, or net stockings were held up by garters, which were often gifts from their admirers. The term painted ladies was coined because the girls had the audacity to wear makeup and dye their hair. Traditional women of the East wore completely different clothing than saloon girls. The differences in styles of women's clothing are enough to make it a metaphor for changing societal and gender norms. The many components that make up a Victorian-style dress are representative of the countless rules that limited women's rights in the East. The restriction of movement due to these dresses is evocative of what little control women had over their lives. Eastern women's roles were minimal. They revolved around domestic work, while men held more prominent, laborious jobs. Women were not allowed to own property, make their own money, or vote. To men, women did not embody the strength or worth that they did. Saloon girls shed these Eastern rules and Victorian ways of dressing. Their scandalous, revealing outfits can be seen as rebelling against the nature of Eastern values and dressage. Saloon girls wore clothes that allowed for free movement, absent of constraints. This can be interpreted as a newly created sense of independence. In other words, some of the rules that restricted women in the East were no longer in existence in the West. Women were thought of as exhibiting more than just domestic qualities in Western society. Saloon girls were now making their own money independently of men, owning land in their own name, and dressing in more expressive clothing. In short, women of the East dressed in a way that symbolized their repressed freedom. But the clothing that saloon girls wore depicted a breaking down of previous societal norms and the adoption of independence. Number 8. Everything was legal. In the Old West, it was up to individual jurisdictions to decide whether or not houses of ill repute were legal or not. According to some historians, the practice was widely accepted. Madams simply needed licenses to run their enterprises. The money from the licensing ensured the city profited. Some historians have noted that bordellos were compelled to pay fines to local governments in order to stay in business. These fines were usually about $8 per month. Many authority figures seemingly chose to overlook these establishments because they supported the local economy. During the 19th century, when the Wild West was in its heyday, there were areas where prostitution was tolerated and even regulated, while in other places it was strictly prohibited. In some frontier towns, particularly those that sprung up around mining camps and railroad construction sites, there was often a lack of law enforcement and a more permissible attitude towards various activities, including prostitution. In these areas, makeshift brothels and saloons might operate openly without much interference from local authorities. Number 7. A Familial Duty There are probably not a lot of differences between some of the reasons why women entered the prostitution business during the Wild West and why they do so today. However, with limited opportunities in the 19th century, many had little choice when they were abandoned by their husbands or stranded in Old West towns when their spouse was killed. Some simply had no other means of providing support. Others were the daughters of prostitutes already tainted in the business. The saddest reason was that women were seduced by a cad, lost their virginity, or were raped. At the time, these women were seen as lost and there was no hope for them virtually forcing them into prostitution. Though the proper ladies ignored the existence of brothels, realistically they admitted their necessity to distract the attention of men from pursuing their daughters and relieving them of their obligation. At the time, Victorian prudence had long taught decent women that the sexual act was solely to bear children. She was taught that she shouldn't respond in any way and that her man should be indulged from time to time, but best to be avoided whenever possible. The men of the West were often intimidated by the decent women who laid down the moral law and found themselves much more comfortable with the painted ladies who allowed them to be who they were. Virtually every Old West town had at least a couple of shady ladies who were the source of much gossip. Sometimes she would hide behind the chore of taking in the laundry as a seamstress or running a boarding house. 
but often she would flaunt her profitable bordello by prancing through the streets in her fine clothing, much to the chagrin of the proper women of the town. Such was the case of Pearl DeVere of Cripple Creek, Colorado. By the 1860s, prostitution was a booming business. Though it was illegal almost everywhere, it was impossible to suppress, so the law generally did little more than to try and confine the parlors and brothels to certain districts of the community. Others regularly fined the brothels and painted ladies as a type of taxation. But otherwise, the businesses thrived with little intervention from the law. Shady ladies were so numerous in some frontier towns that some historians have estimated they made up 25% of the population, often outnumbering the decent women 25 to 1. As the Old West towns grew, they often had several bordellos staffed by four or five women. Usually, painted ladies were between the ages of 14 and 30, with an average age of 23. Number 6. America's oldest profession was in full swing. The Old West undeniably featured sex workers as an integral part of any town or city. It's intriguing, however, that there were so many different options available across the region that offered something for everyone. While some places adhered to the stereotypical portrayal of this work, others held it in higher esteem, providing expansive and elaborate spaces for these workers to operate. Sex work in the Old West was also indicative of socioeconomic classes in society during that time. Many of these workers were young, typically under 30, with limited education and often unable to read or write. Some were immigrants, and pricing for their services was influenced not only by their physical appearance, but also by their nationality and ethnicity. Similar to the anonymous and easily replaceable miners and railroad workers of the American frontier, these workers served a social and economic role driven by the demands of capitalism. However, as individuals, they were often overlooked and forgotten by society. Number 5. Birth control meant ingesting toxins. In an era characterized by more permissive attitudes, one might wonder why there weren't higher birth rates. While condoms were indeed available, they were often prohibitively expensive. As a result, many people turned to medications to terminate pregnancies. These medications often contained toxic ingredients, frequently derived from plant sources, which effectively induced miscarriages. For women involved in activities like sex work, pregnancy posed significant risks. It not only had the potential to end their careers, but also posed life-threatening dangers. In fact, many women on the frontier tragically lost their lives during childbirth. Consequently, women often faced the difficult choice between pregnancies that could be life-threatening or resorting to noxious substances to terminate unwanted pregnancies. Number 4. No privacy during the act. In the Wild West, it was not uncommon for families to reside in small, one-bedroom houses, which meant that every member of the family was sharing the same living space due to the small size of the house. Consequently, achieving privacy, especially when it came to intimate moments, was a significant challenge in such close quarters. The concept of privacy, particularly adult intimacy, developed differently in Europe as compared to the United States. In Europe, during the Reformation era, influential figures like Martin Luther helped establish a sense of sanctity and privacy surrounding intimate matters, which had not existed to the same extent previously. However, in the U.S., privacy often corresponded with socioeconomic class. Those with more financial resources could afford the luxury of private spaces, but the majority of people in the Wild West did not have the means to enjoy such privacy, which made it especially challenging for them to find intimate moments away from the prying eyes and ears of other family members or relatives. Number 3. Some things were too indecent even for cowboys. In Chad Heap's illuminating book, Slumming, Sexual and Racial Encounters in American Nightlife, 1885 to 1940, we uncover the intriguing cultural attitudes that shaped the sexual landscape of this tumultuous time. In an era where societal norms were as rugged as the landscapes these cowboys traversed, Heap reveals that certain practices were deemed too indecent, even for the most daring adventurers. One such taboo was the act of oral pleasure, considered foreign and not commonly embraced by Americans of that era. 
The pages of history paint a picture of a society grappling with its own evolving moral compass. Surprisingly, even within the realms of Old West saloons, where unconventional practices often found a home, evidence suggests that sex workers themselves hesitated to engage in this particular act. In a community where norms were already stretched thin, those who dared to cross that line found themselves ostracized by their peers. It's a fascinating glimpse into the intricate web of sexual norms and stigmas that defined the late 19th and early 20th centuries in the United States. Number 2. The Job Was Dangerous In an era where women faced limited options and were often considered subordinate, the saloon offered an alternative to the toils of farm labor. However, it came with its own set of life-threatening challenges. As we explore the hazards these women faced, it becomes evident that, despite significant technological progress in the last 150 years, the defense against sexual assault lagged far behind. In a world transitioning from steam engines to jet engines sent from outhouses to modern plumbing, the women in saloons found themselves grappling with a disturbingly persistent threat. Violence wasn't just a rare occurrence, it was a hazardous aspect of the job. Men, driven by possessiveness or unreasonable demands, posed a constant danger. In one harrowing tale, a saloon girl endured a physical beating from a customer but it was the accompanying derogatory term that cut deeper than any blow. Surviving the assault was one thing, enduring the insults proved equally challenging. As time wore on, these women faced the harsh reality of aging out of their profession. Considered too old for the job, they encountered a grim lack of alternatives. Some found themselves at the mercy of suicide, sickness, or overdose highlighting the desperate plight that often awaited those who dared to defy societal norms. Number 1. Lack of Education About Sex In the Old West, one of the most noticeable things was the absence of proper education regarding intimacy. Due to the lack of knowledge about one's own body, people found it extremely hard to be in control of their bodies and were also unaware of sexually transmitted infections (STIs). During the late 1800s, there were packets referred to as marriage manuals that aimed to provide some information on the topic. However, these manuals were often inaccurate and strongly emphasized the importance of engaging in intimate activities exclusively within the confines of marriage. They also conveyed the belief that self-pleasure was considered unhealthy, as any use of a man's seed for purposes other than procreation was viewed unfavorably from a religious perspective. In those days, there was no formal education and limited resources available on the subject, so practical learning by doing was often the only option for those seeking more comprehensive information. So there you have it, folks. A glimpse into the lives of Wild West saloon girls, each with a story as unique as the era itself. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to hit that like button, share it with your fellow history fans, and subscribe for more intriguing tales from the Old West. Thank you for watching.